Luke and Mason, we're in for a real treat today. And I'm going to cut this interview, uh, this intro, a little bit short because I want to get into it. But short story, if you guys aren't on the edge of your seats laughing this episode, we're doing something wrong because we got Mike Geo, And you guys know this guy, you know, that from sports card nonsense, hilarious. Uh, there, We need more guys like him and Jesse, who is his co-host. Uh, in the hobby, they take out, they're lighthearted, they're hilarious, they bring you guys good news. And we have the privilege today to sit down with Mike, talk a little bit about both sports, NFTs. Uh, Mike's a big KD collector, so I got to ask the man about how that started and so much more. So without further ado, Mike, I'm really, really excited to have you on the Lucas Tigers and Bronze show today. Appreciate you having me. I'll be honest, I generally strive for low expectation. That was quite the buildup. So now I feel like we're we're sunk off the start, but I'm good with it. That's fine. As long as your as long as your listeners are prepared to be disappointed, like my wife, we're good to go. <laughs> Cage, Cage is the low expectation co-host. I hold our, our our community, our employees, to high standards. I think that we're capable of uh, achieving gotcha. a lot of. This. Yeah, I'm just happy when people show up. I'm Team Cage. I'm just gonna. I'm not biased. I'm just gonna tell you right now, Team Cage. So listen, it's funny because you know. Um, I watch some of your stuff and I think what makes it work, man. And I tell Andrew this all the time as well. I think what works with us is we I mean, listened to our episode yesterday. I mean, you know, one turn the wrong way and we could be brawling in the street is what it sounds like, man. You know I mean? Like it's, you know, rolling around. He probably kicked my ass because you know, I'm out of shape and I'm old, but it is what it is. But you know, the dynamic works. We're not going to agree with each other. I mean, he has MPJ, um, you know, becoming the MVP in five years. And I have him having, you know, three surgeries by that time. So it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. But you know what I found out by, by researching for this episode? There are many of your plays that Andrew just steals. Because MPJ was your play years ago, too. And he obviously is just completely vulturing your stuff, man. Team Cage, so, baby. That's I'm it. Glad yeah, I said I it. There you go, Mike. But now but, you guys are friends. You guys were friends <laughs> before the show. It sounds no, like, though, dude, we have never been in the same room. I was wondering, man, because you guys got like the funny back and forth, like me and Jay. Like you guys go at it, and usually if it's new guys, like everybody's super terrified to say something <laughs> offensive to each other. I was like, man, I, I I told Jay, I was like, I think these guys are friends, like we are outside. But that's funny. I I, nope. I would have sworn you were okay. No, soon enough. I mean, but here's the thing. This is we never in the same room. This is my closest friend now. He won't say that about me because he's got he's one of these guys that got a million friends. I don't. I work. Uh, so, yeah. but he his I talk to him every day, multiple times a day. Sure. I wake I wake up pissed and he's you know he's cheering <laughs> me up. I wake up happy and he's pissing me off. I mean, it's just one of those kind of relationships. <laughs> Sounds about right. So, but I will tell you this: your co-host, Mike. I, I come from uh, I come from an immigrant family. Uh, it's internet. Go ahead, Kate. Yeah, no, yeah, no, you like that random construction. drop. I like. I come from an immigrant family. Done. Go ahead, Cage. Cage, go ahead. He, but he does this. He researches <laughs> ants. He's an immigrant. He makes smoothies. I mean, but he, but it, we will like a Seinfeld episode. We will tie it all in by the end. You will understand like how the immigrant thing. My favorite thing, uh, guys. If you haven't listened to you know to to these guys show the regular the, the the sports card nonsense show, my favorite thing is I don't know soccer, but at least I pretend. I say like, hey, I'm a fan of Barca, and these guys oh, jump all over me, right? So it's a lot of fun. But your co-host is like, hey, you heard of this Mbop guy? You know, like Hanson, and you're like, yeah, no, I gave a play on him last week, and he's yeah. like. All right, Clueless. he plays for this. He plays for this Paris. All right, I, I'm not even going to try. He plays for a team in France. Yep. There's a team in Spain that might be interested. At least he's honest. At least, he's like, I don't know. This is what I heard. You know, it's great. It's a, it's a good dynamic. Really yeah, we got Chris Ryan coming on today. He was like a soccer expert. I just told Jesse, I fully expect to add nothing. I have some bald jokes to make. And then I found out he's the editorial director at the at the station. So I was like, I don't even know if I can make the jokes. <laughs> so it's going to be a short interview. Not a lot of humor. We'll see how it does. I don't know. But I, I know it's huge. I just don't know anything about it. Listen, this is there's a lot of stuff like that out there. And this has been the couple years for that, right? I mean, the last couple years, it's all about, like, what's next? What's exactly. hot? What yep. do you got to jump into first, right? All, yep. right, immig all right, immigrants, go ahead. Give us what you got. Immigrants, we <laughs> get the job all. done. Right? It's a little <laughs> Hamilton. Yeah, my, my internet is choppy. Luke and Asia, I apologize in advance. You guys know I do my best here. Uh no, the immigrant thing is the way you'd prove your theory or you prove your concept is you'd argue, you know, you'd discuss, you'd have discourse. And I think we need more of that. Uh, you're a lawyer. I mean, you discourse for a living. So I think it's healthy. I think uh, I love iron sharpens iron. It's one of my favorite quotes. A question for you, Mike. And Dropping a me, biblical like, reference. Look at Wait, this guy. Iron sharpens iron. By iron. Way, great, great reference. As today. one man sharpens a face of another, show iron. He's dropping proverbs in here. If, Immigrant if you, for the win. Team so Goldberg. I'm going to take, take it from proverbs to 
cardboard relevant. You guys are buying, Wait. you guys are buying UFC Prism this week because it just came out, right? And you're all buying UFC Prism. There is an awesome Tops Dual Auto set called Iron Sharpens Iron. No bull. Really? Right? It's, it's guys. It's guys who trained with each other. So it's like John Jones okay. or Rashad Evans, and you name it. And they're you know champs who train with each other. And it's like Iron Sharpens Iron. And that's in the Prism it. set. No, it's no. This is a, an older top set. I got you. Okay. Iron. So if you if you if you don't feel like spending three thousand dollars on on John Jones's seventeenth year uh, card, go Savage. find one of these for a little bit more, a little bit less money. I'm sure. Go grab a top one, Iron Sharpens Iron. But go ahead, go ahead. Proverbs, Goldberg. Go Mike, uh, Mike is a huge, huge, huge New England fan, and I want oh, you to explain right. this like I'm a two year old to me, okay? Explain okay. the Bill Belichick, Tom Brady feud, and two part question: Were you rooting for Tom Brady in the Super? Yes, yeah, so I'll be. I, I'm a Brady fan first and foremost. I watched every Bucks game this year. I watched a handful of Pats games. I have no problem telling you, like I was a total. I've been a Brady guy since I was uh, 14. That's it. But, but like, what kind of Brady guy? Like a fan or like a, a Ted Two? I'm gonna sneak into Brady's house and do bad things to him while he sleeps. Kind of fan. I mean, I don't. You, you say bad things. I just say like <laughs> things. I'm not gonna say they're. You know. <laughs> you're a lawyer listen here's the thing cage it's not what you know it's what you can prove okay this is so, very true very i don't true. i don't know if i'm supposed to sign a waiver no i i love I, i've always been a brady guy so when he left followed him to tampa you know big big tampa fan now and, and again total bandwagon because i'm a brady guy i have no no qualms about it and then when it comes to the belichick brady thing a couple of years ago I have always said this about anybody who talks about New England sports. None of us know anything. I knew a couple of guys in the media back then, and they would tell you the same thing. They got to speak publicly about stuff because it's a big article or it's a big story. But they would all anybody good and relevant in Boston would tell you pure speculation. He doesn't talk to anybody. Nobody on the staff talks. To it is unbelievable how locked down. That's why when I hear these rumors like the Pats are getting ready to move up, they could very easily move out of the top six rounds and just trade for a bunch of fourth-round offensive linemen next year. It's just – it's no clue. Um, but the feud, I mean, it was pretty uh, – the only one thing that was clear is Bill liked Jimmy Garoppolo, which it sounds like they may have a shot to get back now. Um, I don't know. Uh, to me, if you can win a championship, I'm mortgaging a lot of future to do it. I mean, how many teams are never going to win a ring? Maybe you should have kept him around, although he's not winning in New England this year, so I don't think it would have mattered. But in general, if you can forfeit some future prospects to get a championship in any sport, I'm I'm pretty much all for it, and I forgot the second question. I got so excited. It was, you it was answered, what, you, what what do you think of immigrants? Was his second question. So when you say immigrant, what are we talking like <laughs> like? Because I get accused of being Italian all the time, like Michael Paulino Giuseppe. I I eat Italian food, and that is it. I cannot speak any Italian. <laughs> I've never been to Italy. My parents have never been to Italy. Their parents were born here. I am like fourth generation. It's the most watered down. But Jersey Shore wannabe thing. Mike has a nice leather jacket and does drive a Camaro, so he gets points there. I got a smoking leather jacket. That is true, actually. <laughs> People ask me when we go out with it, they're like, do you ride? And I'm always like, I don't, I don't even know. I got that like five or six times, and I was like, I don't know. And finally, my wife was like, they're talking about a bike, you idiot. I'm like, no, I don't. No, I pedal. That's how I roll. Yep. Well, listen, I love this because I thought my brother was the only person in the world who switched teams because of a player. But I guess Brady has the same kind of thing. My brother, just get some age, my younger brother, but when Montana, he was a huge Niners fan. Huge Niners fan. Okay. When Montana switched over to KC, he became a KC fan. And same Montana with me. was yep. good for them, didn't win the Super Bowl, but he has remained a KC fan, which has worked out nicely for him now because he gets, you know, he gets to the glory that is Mahomes now. So. Yeah. So that's a tough thing for me. Once Brady leaves, I'm I'll be done with honestly, once Brady leaves, I gotta find something to do to watch football. Like I'll have to find another interest in the game. I'm very loyal to players, so when they leave, I'm just bored. Like the Red Sox, I'm the least passion sports fan in the world now. Like the Red Sox won in 04 and 07. It was huge. Then the whole the whole team's gone. Now I'm like, okay, I like them. I'll watch them now and again. KG, Paul, and Ray were like my Celtics guys. Loved it. After that, it was like, okay, I, I like Tatum. I'll watch him now. The Bruins, I haven't watched a hockey game in like 10 years since they last went to the Cup. And then the Pats, I'm like, this isn't the Pats team I know or grew up with. So I just, when Brady retires, I'm going to get into soccer. That's, I've decided. So you, subscribe to, soccer. You, you subscribe to that model, like Gary says, you know, New England is the most spoiled fan. You subscribe to that? I always say anybody under the age of 30. Yep. Anybody younger than me spoiled out of their minds because they've known <laughs> nothing but they've known nothing but championships. But I grew up with Drew Bloodsoe getting smoked, the Red Sox getting demolished by the Yankees. You know, the Bruins were always meh. And then the Celtics, I mean, when you're rooting for Antoine Walker, I don't know what you're doing with your life. 
<laughs> He's your cousin. The, from, you're the uh, biggest Drew Bledsoe collector right there in the, in the top left. Corner. I have more Drew Bledsoe cards than anybody in the world. Trust me. Trust. Drew Bledsoe might be the best quarterback of all time to never get in the Hall of Fame. I would say that. And, uh, an argument can be made for Boomer Sison. Boomer Sison, at Boomer? least an MVP. You know, he was an MVP. Mm, that's true. Hall of Fame, so. well, I mean, Bledsoe was very good, though. He just – wrong time. If Bledsoe comes 10 years earlier – Oh, He's yeah. probably a Hall of Fame guy because he's stationary, pocket quarterback, don't run, don't move, big arm. Yep, statue so. with a cannon, right? Statue and he was the nicest cannon. guy in the world. I met him a couple times at, like, fan events up there. Yep. Like, the nicest guy I've ever met in my life. So, Gio, well, listen, can I call you, Gio? I don't okay? call me. Are, yeah, of course. Are, are How'd, you get into <laughs> sports cards? How'd you get into collecting? I collected as a kid. I got an older brother. He's seven years older than me. And we just, yeah, as kids, we had a card shop a couple miles away. We'd go in and get, a, you know. 10 cent pack or 20, whatever they were, and just collected. We were both Griffey fans growing up because he had his hat on backwards. So he was really? the only, he was the only non white, non fat guy playing baseball that I remember as a kid. So that was it. He was like actually kind of cool. And that was so you, it. And I love A Rod. Like, you didn't like John Cruck, is what you said. Cruck you is actually who exactly what I was thinking of. I <laughs> saw Cruck and I was like, I don't even know. There's something attached to the back of his head, it's oily and it looks like a mop. This is the Phillies days now. He's right. weighing in at about, about two and a half bills, and that's being very generous. He cannot run a 40-yard dash because he literally couldn't complete it. And I was like, I could play baseball. I could right. I could be a professional. And my brother is actually a wicked ball player. He played Division II college ball, switch hitter, savage baseball player. I was terrible. I just like shag fly balls. That's all I could do. When you and your brother showed up to the card store, though, were they happy to see you? Or were they like, uh-oh, it's these two again? No, no. He he is super pleasant, and I was too young to be opinionated. All so right. it, it worked back then. <laughs> I have my... I have trouble now with card shops because a lot of, there's a lot of bull crap. But back then, total hobby mm. purist love. So I got to I gotta get you to talk about that bull crap because that's the fun stuff. But I'll tell you, my brother and I, we used to walk at the card stores, and they called us the Brothers Grimm. Like, the Brothers Grimm are here. Hide the packs. Okay. You know, we had, uh, you know, we had we had a whole fun little reputation in the Staten Island uh, in the Staten Island card stores, card stores, and it was from one product. I've talked about this a couple of times, but in case there's new new folks to this, in 1994, Absolute Football product. It had a uh, it had a um, an insert called uh, Pigskin Previews. And oh it was, yeah, it okay. was a leather backed card. Like yeah, the, yep. like the Levi's thing on the jeans. It was remember. actually made of leather, like a football thing. It was one in every other box. And we used to have them open up a new box for us, and we could tell you when they opened it up whether or not the insert was in that box or not, because it had a smell. You could smell the leather through the sealed <laughs> packs. So like, oh here they are, they're here to smell the packs. <laughs> the brothers grim. So it's a fun little story. So what's wrong with card stores <laughs> now? Because that sounds like it's juicy. What's you know, the BS some, going on with cards? Some stores? are good. I mean, like we've got a couple here in Nashville. I, I mean, I'm, I'm close with the owners. I, I, I like them, um, but you know, it's like any other hobby. There's so much money in it now. People just feel the need to lie about stuff, and I hate it. Like with allocation, that's always a big thing for me. I, I still own a, a big chunk of a breaking company. We do a ton of money in volume a year. Um, just tell people what. It, like yesterday with Prism, I had to hear like fifty thousand people tell me, "Well, you know, I got to be at twelve hundred because I paid a thousand. That's okay. We paid $126 a box for UFC Prism. That was Good. our cost. That Good. was everybody's cost. I, I, but I don't justify. I just tell people up front, we're going to be competitive in pricing. We're going to make a ton of money. Years ago, we didn't make a ton of money. When I took out a loan and borrowed money from literally in-laws and maxed out credit cards, we weren't making money. So now that I'm making a ton of money doing it, I don't feel bad. But I also feel like you can just be up front about it. You know, people make up these scenarios where it's like, poor me, or, or this stupid thing where, you know, I, I have to buy all this crap product to get good stuff. Name any product in the last two years you've lost money on. You don't. So just be upfront. I don't I don't think you need to brag about it. I come across as arrogant, and I don't mean to. I just, I get aggravated when people play the pity card or the sympathy thing. Like, you know, I got to do this to, to make, it's like, no, we're in the, the most flush market of all time. If you had the stones to open up a brick and mortar. I don't, you don't think you need to hide your success. Just say, yeah, I make a lot of money doing it now because I was doing it when nobody was Correct. cool. And then I hate the other model of like, I've just seen too many like young guys and it happens at shows, young guys and kids get taken advantage of. Hey, I've got this card. Will you trade it for 10 bucks? It happened one time. The only time I, I am too old and weak to ever get physical with anybody, but it happened at a show in Nashville. Kid tried to sell a Unitas card and the guy offered him 10 bucks. And this kid was thrilled. Like $10 of this kid was the world. And I almost burned the whole card show down. I was yelling like a maniac. I just started breaking. I was just out of my mind. I just hate that stuff. You can be honest and just give the kid 70%. But to give like, it's a little crap like that. 
some of the old heads in the industry, I just it, that stuff really, really fumes me up. I'm glad, by the way, 126 cost. It was 126 so, cost. So I've talked about this and how yeah. it's it's you know, but but what's funny is I gave Panini a pass on it and said, oh, you know, Panini, it's not them that are raising the price on this stuff. It's not them when they're selling it directly to their people. It's not that much money. And I will be picking up a box today, and my LCS has got a, one box direct, mm -hmm. and he's charging me 225 for it. That guy's a saint. And good for him. And here's the other thing. Another huge misconception. Panini is marking up prices on this stuff. If the market wasn't what it is, then nobody would buy it. That's right. And I tell people the same thing. Well, if you only paid 126, why don't you sell it for 250 like that guy? Your yep. shop owner doing that with one box, fantastic, right? 225. I, but I've been awesome. buying from him for the last decade. Sure. And I, was, and, I, I have actually gone in and he said to me, hey, Cage. I, I'm not buying this wrestling product in 2012. No one will buy it in my store. It's a $500 case direct from Tops. Can you take it? And I would buy his allocation to keep him in good standing with Tops. Yeah. So it's know? a relationship. You, so, you've helped him gain that equity. Yeah. So I mean, but my I, problem is when people like people will hear that and be like, "Oh, well, then how do you justify selling for a thousand bucks?" Because that's what the market dictates. The same well, reason I'm selling Bitcoin at fifty-five thousand. Because that's what it is. I don't care that I paid a hundred dollars ten years ago. Well, listen, but here's where I don't give Panini a pass. They just did their direct to consumer release, right? Eight seventy five. Eight seventy five. Right? So I was gonna say, oh, it's the it's the it's 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 you know, you you gotta blame the distributors. You gotta blame everybody everybody makes a statue of a carvin, right? But it's go mm -hmm. GTS, right? I mean, you gotta blame them. They're marking the price up and, and but but Panini did it themselves. And, and even right. the, it's the market. And even the distributor thing is a myth. GTS Peach State Southern allocate Southern allocates everything. By the way, they don't hold anything back. They're here local. I know the owners. I've known them for years. To their detriment, they will just give out everything at allocated price, and good for them. Which is I great. would not do. I wouldn't do that, but they do. Peach State and GTS still allocate way more than they need to. So even them, yeah, are they marking the price up? Sure, but the overall point is, if the market doesn't accept the price, it's not going to get sold. And right. everybody's going. It's like 2016. We were flipping Bowman Chrome cases and breaking even. Yep. We, Panic, you know, so that's just not the case right now. And singles prices follow that. Wax and singles have always been connected. It's always the same thing. So I, that's why I don't really have an issue with it. So we had somebody on, and and you know, I, I'll make my play for folks like you who are baking, and for folks who have brick and mortars. I will never complain about you guys making money because there are times, lean years, where you're not making money, and you got to sure. make your money. Everybody's got to make their money. We had a, a guest, Bro Namath, on. Um, we've had him on a couple of times. Great. Bro Namath. Bro Namath, exactly. Not Bro Montana. <laughs> Bro Namath, right? Does he have a drinking so, problem like Joe does? He may, but uh, we're not sure. Okay. But, uh, he looks in pretty good shape. Like he would definitely kick my ass. So I'm not gonna say anything bad about him. But okay. but one well. of the things he says: don't squeeze all the juice out of the berry. Like there's enough. Sure. There's enough to go. Leave some fat. Leave some meat on the bone. I think was his saying, right? No so, question. So it sounds like Petri go GTS. They're marking it up. They're doing with it, but they still are being fair about it. Like the one thing is that you don't have to squeeze every single dollar, you know, let, let, let a kid get something every now and again. You know I mean? That's make your money. I agree. And, and honestly, I, I think it's cool that retail is starting to get super strict with how many you can buy. To me, that's the space when the market is like it is. I don't need kids buying flawless and NT for a fair price. Right. I'm not, I know that's our prism. It's not going to happen, yep. but can we make retail skews unbelievably attainable for everybody? Yep. Cool. There's your part of the kids. If that's the case, can we give Top Shot a pass? Right. If uh, I know you're famously not a Top Shot guy, and I wanted to bring this up for this exact reason, can we give Top Shot a pass because they've been up front and the market just dicks it? Oh, he's got hey, a knife. He's, he's gonna, gonna cut myself here. He's gonna cut myself. I thought he was gonna cut the immigrant. I would never. <laughs> um, I mean, here's the deal. I would have given it a pass if it was attainable for kids. What kid? What kid can get on there and sit in the queue and has like the technology to buy Top Shot packs in their release? It's illegal. It's illegal. It's you illegal. have to be eighteen to do it anyway, so it's not for kids. Oh, okay. So I didn't even know that. You so take here's, kids out. So what? But there's a reason for that. On. You can't invest in stock or crypto if you're under eighteen too. So it's not just. Okay, so so make the discussion bigger then. Who's buying for kids anyways? If a kid goes to a car shop, his parents are buying it for him. What parent, yep. when these things drop, have a shot to get it? I don't fault Top Shot for that. The market exploded, right? I can't be mad that your company is just crazy successful. But at the same time, I don't. I look at it and say, I don't know what this does for kids. The Tops thing's a little different because Tops market, although it did balloon real quick, it's it's come down. It's relatively attainable, relatively. 
but then it's on this wax platform. It's so hard to navigate. It's like, I don't, I thought it would have been great. Make tops bunt, make 80,000 million, hundred trillion packs. It's an official number. Mm -hmm. Make them everywhere. Come up with four products a year that are retail and you are going to overproduce unbelievably and just make pockets for the kids in good markets. You, There's a place to do it. It's just not the most profitable for companies, so they don't. And I don't, and I can't fault them for that either. I don't do things that aren't profitable. Occasionally, we do like giveaways and stuff. That's one thing. But in general, I have a business to make money. So I don't fault companies for pricing people out. And I don't fault people for being mad that, hey, this isn't the hobby I grew up in and my kids can't be a part of it. I just, that's the reality of a capitalistic market that's thriving, I think. Can it be both? Can't I own cards and also own moments? Like, I, I think we've, we've kind sure. of divided the hobby into almost two different categories. And I want to ask you about the Gary BNFT next. Uh, that might be a sensitive sub subject. Five, five. I have to see these stupid numbers. This thing better be the greatest thing in the history of mankind. I like Gary. He was gracious to come on. I have zero use for him on social media, personally. I know he's a you know this social media god. Wait, what's going on in five five? That's all. It's five five, huge release. Five five five. No, dude, no. It he's just telling everybody what, how tall he is. I don't like short jokes, Cage. Team <laughs> Team Goldberg. Um, I just I, that's fine. Like it better be the greatest release. In the, it better be like an NFT that cures cancer. Like how there about we this? go. Can we ask for a little less, Mike? Can we? Can we just say? It better be something we know what the hell it is. I mean, yeah. what's being dropped? I have a feel. Um, honestly, you know I have Andrew. a feeling it's going to be those stupid doodles he always drops on Twitter or something, and it's going to be like those NFT style or something. Maybe not. With Maybe utility. it's a huge thing. with utility. I've already explained this to Case, but he does never listens to me. It's going to be those doodles, but you're going to have a chance to shadow his team for a day at Team Gary B in New York, or go to dinner with him, or go to a Knicks game. That's kind of cool. That's what, it's so funny. The market's so fascinating. When Top Shot came out, had that boom. People were like, wow, this is cool, but it's kind of just a YouTube clip. If you could attach like utility, like you could sit courtside or you get a pair of Terry Rozier autographed shoes, that would be cool. That's sure. what Gary's yeah. going to do, and then he gets shit on. It's, but we're, but, we but don't here's know what why, we want. right? So, and I, I can't believe you brought this up, Mike, because over the last week, I've gotten more heat from, from Andrew for my goal. My, my, from our my, fans, my, not from me. No, from, from you, about me and my, what I'm doing to Gary and how I'm not being nice to Gary and how I'm trolling Gary, which it is not what it is, you know. Code. But uh, I think you did say I was trolling Gary, but it's okay. It's, it's, it's a it loose interpretation. It's a loose okay. interpretation. It's, but here's the thing. How is it any different than a raffle? How is it any different than him just saying, okay, everybody, I want you to just put $25 in and I'm going to pick one out of 1,000 people to come have dinner with me. I'm going to pick one out of 20 people to come and meet with my team for a day. Okay, this raffle's $1,000 a person. Why do we need it to be tokenized? Why do we need it to be NFT'd? Why do we need ridiculous doodles that nobody wants? You're, you're giving an argument to justify this, but I'm telling you, it's a cash grab, and you don't need it. He's capitalizing on the NFT craze of the year. Everybody else is doing Everybody's dropping it. And the mm -hmm. answer you give to justify it afterwards is, well, he's going to add utility to it. Okay. If he really wants to provide his fans a one in a thousand shot to go to dinner with him or a one in 10,000 shot to go to a, a Nick game with him or a one in a thousand right. shot to have a Zoom meeting with him, then why doesn't he just on his website say $25 a raffle? You know, there's a basket of cheer. You get this bottle of Jameson. You know, like any other raffle that's been happening since the dawn of time, right? But instead, he's going to tokenize this, make everybody buy Ethereum, get everybody in it, and then one in a thousand people is going to be able to have an hour meeting with him the same way it would be without an NFT. Yeah, I, I, so the NFT thing, I, I think there's a, I do think it's like the wave of the future. I mean, it's clear that that's, it gives people instant accessibility. There's no national boundaries and, and makes things super tradable. My thing is just, I don't care about it, but I, I feel that way about Top Shot, but I think it's going to be hugely successful. I mean, with Gary Vee, like he could do the, 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 um, you know, like the raffle thing, like you're saying, I think his bigger point is he does it like this. It builds an event. You know, he's all about community. I get why he's doing it. I also just get like, to me, I don't care. I think it's probably going to be wildly successful, though. And I and I don't fault him for doing it. Is it a cash grab? I mean, maybe, I guess. I, NFTs are so hot, though. I just, I I don't, I'm sick. My own, my really, my biggest issue with the NFT thing is, if you're a card collector, Top Shot's a thing of the future. You have to be in it. And my argument has just been, no, you don't. 
There's plenty of people. The card world is going to succeed separately, and, and Top Shot is going to succeed and has succeeded separately. Same thing with the NFT market. I would never spend 10 cents on an NFT of Tom Brady, but that thing is going to be huge when it comes out. But I'll spend money in the card world. So I think they're just both going to survive and thrive. I just think it's going to be largely separate from each other. Plus, he's a Jets fan. I don't have any opinion. I mean, I have nothing to say good about that team or anybody roots for him. So, listen, if know. this thing goes the way I think he is planning to go, he'll probably be the Jets owner. Be on, yeah, maybe that's the NFT. I'm owning the Jets and giving away shares. Geo, something you, that your fans say, I want to know if this is true. You could bench 385 pounds and your hands are as big as Kawhi Leonard. Back factor fiction. Dude, yeah, these were comments under your post when people saw how big your hands were. Not true. Oh, I took a picture of myself in the tux. My hand was close to the camera. Uh, three eighty-five is a stretch. We are setting up something with a live camera. I don't want to be. I don't want to be arrogant. I'm yoked, so just. Uh, I I can probably do like I'm, I. My claim was three fifty-ish, which I stand by. I think. I think I'm gonna get. I'm pretty excited. I'm not gonna lie. How long can we go? Do we have another thirty-five minutes? Let's break down the workout routine here. This hard stop at eleven is <laughs> bull crap. Uh, we, I told Jesse, we got to find a bench at some random person's house. Just show up and film it because now we're being called out. It has to happen. So normal hands, though. Normal Can't even palm a bas Can't even palm a basketball. Right now, uh, as far as bench pressing goes, if you told me I could bench press 100 pounds or 400 pounds, I wouldn't know because I don't believe I have been on a bench press or have attempted to press anything in uh, quite some time. I pressed I paninis. That's fair. I mean, Applicable. Yeah, sure. That's okay. <laughs> you know, whatever works. Yep. I don't, yeah. I, I guess I got to start doing that, man. Maybe we, you know, we'll Why? set up a little bench press. Who cares? If you don't like, I mean, I do it for mental health, honestly. I'm a psychopath well, otherwise. I gave up on it's mental what I do health the podcast. a long time ago. If you've listened to any of my podcasts, my mental health is a, is a, is a, is a foregone thing. It's, it's, already been, it's already been given away. Yeah. I I'm not. I just I, I have my little outlets for mental health because otherwise I am just a nut job. I'm super. People think I'm critical on the show. It's just times a thousand. So I just decided, hey, I, I go live on Facebook now and I'm feeling like a psychopath that day and just talk about it. Go throw some weights around so I don't kill anybody, myself included. Works out good so far. Not, not me. When I'm in that kind of mood, what I do is I find like a really good kombucha, right? I um, you know, I, I do a little yoga. You know, I, I try to take a you know a little stroll on the beach. You know, I didn't out. picture you. I didn't picture you as a yoga man. This is nice. Yeah. Well, I I was just explaining what Andrew does. Sure. Yoga, okay. I've, done, I've done yoga once, and it was just basically a fart session. Somebody <laughs> said do yoga, and all I did was just fart for like a half an hour. It was it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Coming full circle. <laughs> <laughs> yep. so, okay, Andrew's like, I don't really know where to go it. next. <laughs> I, I always know where to go. It just you got, you got to navigate. Out of my, my, He's my an immigrant. He's help. an immigrant. He knows he knows what to do. <laughs> I want to talk about KD, but yesterday, Cage and I had a, a discussion, a discourse about Michael Porter Jr. And I personally feel Michael Porter Jr. is a young KD. So I want to read two comments that our community has said about you, Cage. Uh, yes. Guy that says MPJ sucks, never played a second of organized basketball in his life. Not my quote, just a direct quote. He starts basically every game this year and plays 30 minutes. Sits on the bench and claps, is what Cage said about Michael Porter Jr., but no, you're I did KD not say fan. that. I did not say he sits on a bench. This is, these, I'm reading you direct quotes from our community. I don't put these in. These aren't my burner accounts. Well, they're the same people who said Speaking that Kawhi, account, Kawhi Kevin Leonard Durant. hands. You know, I mean, you know, I can't please everybody, man. I, MPJ, I guess I'm a market guy. Silly. I, I mean, yeah, where, I like MPJ. Here's the other thing, too. I'm not a KD fan. I don't like him. I just went heavy mm -hmm. investing in him because, I. yeah, I don't like him as a player. I don't like him as a person. I don't like anything about I don't dislike him. Good. But I, he's a super team guy, spineless. I just think there's money to be made on his cards. So I love it. A, love it. So love you don't, it, and you don't subscribe to buy what you love. That's not how you invest. Buy what makes money. That's not when I money. not in my investments. My PC is just stuff I like. But no, when KD and John Moran are my two biggest investments, I don't care about either one. Although I do like Morant now, watching him play. But KD, I always said for our generation, I, I say that post Kobe. It's it's LeBron far and away one, but then it's KD and Curry are the only other two guys who have a resume and the stats and the greatness to back it up. And I just think he's super undervalued. Even now, I think he's undervalued. And if they go on a finals run, I hate that he's going to win a finals or may win a finals here. He's doing the super team thing again, but a ring is a ring at the end of the day. Uh, Michael Porter Jr., I like. 
the comparison to KD is rough. I've never seen Porter Jr. get his shot consistently like KD does, but he's also not the guy there. So that's tough to, you know, if he was the guy, would he, would he, would his offensive game take more steps? Possibly. But when you got Joker and Jamal Murray, we've also, now I was impressed when he stepped up. One of two things was going to happen when Murray's knee popped. MPJ was going to step up and do what he's done, or he was going to, or he was going to start facing the number one, number two defensive guy on the other team and shut down. He's played really well. Um, but I don't know how much higher a ceiling he has. Like if he's asked to run that offense or if he's even the number one option in an offense, I don't think that's a, I don't know that that's even a playoff team yet. We haven't seen him enough either though. What's he played less than a full season total, right? His injuries have been brutal when healthy. He's had some elite moments. No question. So, so who's your guy in the NBA? Like who do you really like to watch? Yeah, again, it's funny. I, I'm so, I was so loyal to who I grew up with. Now I, I'm a very oh. passive NBA fan. I like watching John Morant. I actually really like his game. I think he's a star. Um, Tatum, I like. Tatum has not been super consistent in the postseason, and that angers me. Again, I'm spoiled as a Tom Brady fan. If you don't get it done when it counts, I, I have trouble with that. Um, I love and hate Curry. I hate Curry because of how dominant he is. I respect and think he's awesome because when he's on a tear, there's no one like him. Um, John Wall's another guy randomly. I always like just enjoyed watching. He's made it look effortless. I don't know why. Um, yeah, and Joker. You gotta like Joker. Like I, I, I don't. I think Joker is the next superstar. Just to take. Well, I say that. He, I don't know how much of a personality he has, but I think Joker's game is just awesome to watch. He is like Shaq passing the ball, and just a weird combination of Shaq, Dirk, and I don't know whoever else you want to throw there. I think he's. I, I actually think he's fun to watch. MPJ, yeah. I take heat, which is great. I love it, right? I like MPG better. Michael Paul Giuseppe. That's it, Michael Paul Giuseppe. I like MPG better, but here's also miles per gallon. Here's sure. miles per gallon, exactly. But here's my my fun, right? Have you guys watched modern basketball prices? So everybody's, you know, like, hey, Michael Porter Jr. scored some points. You were in on an April eighteenth. Andrew obviously watched your little episode and then made his play based on that. A um, moderate size episode. So you know, a moderate size episode. But so here's the deal, right? So uh, obviously Andrew did not steal his play. He's been giving Michael Porter Jr. for a year and a half. But I mean, we I'm called him, Porter in February. We called Porter time. in February too. So, but here's my my take. Great, on it, right, guys. It, you're, you hit the nail on the head. It's a ceiling, right? People have now steamed that card up to what, $300, $400? You know, I mean, it's just crazy. It was, right, it, you know, when it went, yeah. So, but have you guys noticed? I mean, Luka Doncic, right? Everybody loves the guy, right? He's going to be the next big thing. He's, you know, mm -hmm. awesome. There's no one who, the guy the other night scored 39, and, you know, I mean, and which is what Michael Porter Jr. scored. But when Luka scores 39, no one talks about it. Michael Porter Jr. scores 39, it's his career high, and everyone's like, oh my God, this guy's God, right? right. So, but here, Luka's prices, have you looked at what's going on with Luca's Prism PSA 10 right now? They're down another 10% in the last month. They're, they're, they're under 1,000. They're under 1,000. Oh, are 1, they under now? I saw 1020. Under, under, under 1,000. 1, under 1,000 dollars. You know, the last couple on Star Stock have sold right around 1,000, right? I mean, so those cards are. So how, how do you do that? How do you justify it, right? The guy may be a great player, right? He may be a one or a two on team, maybe him and Joker and Jamal Murray and the whole deal, but, but you still have to compare them value wise and, like you said, ceiling wise. To some of the studs that are out there, some of the, the you know the marquee names that are out there, and I mean, I know Andrew said he's going to be an MVP in five years. He's going to be a scoring leader in the league in the next two or three for MPJ. But I mean, are we really putting him in like Luca territory? I mean, we really do. We expect his card is going to be you know the the price of what Luca is. It's the same year, so it's a nice easy you know comparison as far as like the card goes and whatnot. But he's so, trading at thirty three percent, right? Third, basically. right now, about a third. Yeah. Right now, about a third. I mean, I think to me personally, I think it's about as high as we see him get. But but put some of the guys he's outselling though. He's outselling Trey Young now. He's outselling yeah, John Moran. A lot. You know, I I think a lot of it has to do with and I tell people this too, like this dip. This happens every year in almost every sport. People get, except for NFL. NFL in season, because we only get the one game, it's different. But same with baseball. Acuna is going to be on a tear like we haven't seen in a long time come June, July, if he keeps us up. And his prices are going to tamp taper off. Because it's just it's just wear down of the season. I think guys that get collectors in the hobby are like, yeah, this is great. I got another ninety games to go. Mm -hmm. You start to focus elsewhere. Same with basketball. It's like stuff got so high mid February for just about everything, and now it's like, okay, let's chill out with it. Let's if if somebody pops like MPJ was super low, he popped great. Other than that, I think we'll see 
and I do subscribe to the playoff thing. I know some people say there's data that it doesn't happen. I don't know what they're looking at. I sold my Lucas the night he hit the game winner against the Clippers. I held two. I sold everything else I had. Nineteen hundred to two grand instantly. I mean, so so I know there's a direct connection, but especially success in the playoffs. And you have said this. I've I've seen on your show both MPJ and Joker. Your buyer. I love you want Joker. To sell, you want to sell first round of the playoffs. Yeah, because, again, like Denver without Murray. Now, if Murray's there, it's a different story. I'm holding Joker until the end because I think, realistically, they have a shot to come out of the West with Murray. Without Murray, I, I just don't I, – I see them winning a round, although even that's tough. If them and the Lakers go in 4-5, that's a exactly weird – Exactly what I said. Exactly Dude, you don't want to play. The Lakers are going to throw – what's going to be hilarious to me is if the Lakers go in as the 7 and play this play-in round. I just think that's just hilarious because I think we'll see LeBron just go nuts and take over, but – um, same with the, with Utah. I love Mitchell. I've been pumping him up and trying my hardest to, and I don't own a single Mitchell card cause he's been my hardest <laughs> pump. I just don't know that he's ever going to move the needle value wise until he beats the Lakers in a postseason series. I just don't know if anybody cares, which is weird to me. We've talked about that. The Suns, the Nuggets, I hate the, the Jazz, oh the, they're all in my, the same thing. Show me, show me. You can beat one of those West Power yeah, teams like DeAndre Ayton, I feel like is the most phony center in the world. He's fine for a young player, and it's not his fault we've propped him up, but he's propped up, super overrated. Devin Booker's crazy talented offensively, does nothing else and doesn't contribute to wins. This year it's different. You got Chris Paul, and the people are enamored with Chris Paul this year. He's done the same thing this year he always does. Chris Paul is unbelievable. He is Peyton Manning. Regular season, he's fantastic. He is not going to get it done in the postseason. Not always his fault. But you can't tell me a guy who's been in the league 15 years and has never made a finals appearance is an all-time great. He's great, first ballot Hall of Famer. He's never been to a finals? I don't care what the competition is. you got to get in one year. I, I just This year will be no different. I think the Clippers or the Lakers would steamroll either one of those teams. Gio, how did you find yourself in the radio podcast business? And what made you and Jesse decide to start uh, – so I sold the breaking company in August. I was just like, you know, the market can't get much better. The The time it takes to do something like that. I was a one man show. Um, I was just out. I'm 35 right, this year. I was just like, you know, I can't, I can't keep doing the stay, you know, start working at eight in the morning and finish up at four or five in the morning, four days a week. It just, oh. it was just killing me. And my wife was like, Hey, you know, we, we'd like to <laughs> like spend time together. So I, we decided to sell the company. Listen, by the way, anybody listening to that who's like, oh, come on, I want a dream job, breaking, what, what is this guy talking about? I will just tell you, we did one break or two breaks, mm -hmm. and I had the same thing. One night, and my family's like, what are you doing, and how long is it taking? And my, I woke up the next day, my back hurt from like arching <laughs> over the camera like this, and I was like, I what the hell that. am I doing? And, nope. and then to pack everything up, and labels, and Andrew was even helping me with the labels and stuff like that. And it's like, and I only did it one time. One yeah, night, it's, you know, and it's like awesome. Case. Like it's oh. fun getting to see product and rip. Everything else is miserable. Checking payments, sorting, shipping, answering, you know, hundreds of messages. And there's other break rooms that are much bigger. So it wasn't like we were the biggest room around, but we I would ship twice a week, three to three to four hundred and fifty packages, you know, both times. It's just time. But anyway, so we decided to sell that off. I kept 20% of the company and I still kind of go live and mess around with the company uh on geo breaks. Um, so I, that was perfect, but I was like, I need a side hustle. I need something else to do now. I'm getting money in from that because I own a piece still, but I'm not super visible. I'm not tied up. Um, we, we buy and flip some houses, but again, I got a, my one of my best friends down here runs the whole thing, does everything, and he's my partner in it anyway. So I don't do anything there. So I was like, I got to do something. So we started just making – we would just started going live on Facebook actually, just talking sports and cards a little bit and making fun of stuff. And, you know, I just felt like a lot of people were in the space – are not super genuine, and especially people who have a platform. Like like you guys, I've heard you guys talk. It's a pretty genuine, authentic show, right? Like I don't feel like you guys are sitting here scripted, like I have to say this because this guy's listening. But there's a lot of these other shows. I'm just like – We have the opposite it? of a script, bro. We, yeah, which I think is part – I never that, know what, he's, what we're going to do. <laughs> which I think is perfect. I think it's just authentic. My thing was I would like to hear a show where people just talk like they would talk at a card show or they talk at a sport like at a, at a Sox game. And no one does that. Everybody's terrified to be themselves on the radio. And they got to have this voice and you got to make sure you're politically correct. And I was like, this is boring. I don't, I would never associate with somebody like that in real life. So I was like, so we started out of spite. I was just like, hey, I'm going to just have fun doing a podcast. I don't need the money. I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm going to do it. And like five episodes in, we got a, a Chris Vernon called me. 
And I was like, what? I, I thought it was fake. And he just called. He's like, hey, you know, you got to talk to my boss, Bill. He kept saying it and saying it. And I was like, finally, I was like, who is Bill? He says, oh, I work at the ringer. And aside from my show and Simmons runs it. And that was it. He's like, hey, the space is blowing up. Bill's huge into the into the card world. Uh, Vernon's big in the card world. And they just say, hey, we want to have you come over. Pure chance. Vernon heard our clips on TikTok when he was like monitoring his kid's phone. And that's how it started. <laughs> No joke. He's like, I heard some guy like yelling about cards in the other room because Jesse was just putting it on TikTok, putting it everywhere. He heard, saw that and just made, just gave us a call. So, so my question for you, which you know we have, we have a discerning taste. Our audience, how Luca Nation, they're smart. They don't let shit like that go. So you started this off. You did five episodes of I don't have to be politically correct. I'm just gonna go out there and talk like I would mm -hmm. talk. You name it. Yep. Does the signing on with with Bill and the Ringer tamp that down a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, there's certain. So, I mean, very little um, when it comes to content. He's he's pretty much given us free reign. Um, uh, there are certain things, though, like if if a major event happened in a in a you know the cultural world, like if something just in mainstream culture happened, I would talk about it on the podcast before. Now it's a little bit more like for now. Hey, stay in your lane. Talk cards. Um, and and obviously, I mean, if you listen to the ring, there's certain things we just. You know, you kind of just stay away from. Like, I haven't talked about Deshaun Watson. That's on purpose. I don't. It's just not a subject we, they want us talking about. I have no problem with that. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I don't love getting into the political, the political world. I have no interest in it at all. I have no interest in politics. Uh, and there's just a lot of subjects now that if you talk about them, regardless of your take, it's political, right? Like even something as stupid as if I wear a mask, it's because I'm one side of a, a political party or another. I have. I am completely neutral politically. I do not care. And if I do or don't wear a mask or I do or don't agree with this side or that side, it shapes this whole bubble where, you know, you're this color, you know, you're, you're red, you're blue, whatever. I'm neither and I don't care. And so there's some things I have to stay away from for sure. Um, and that's to me, it was like, hey, that's the sacrifice, right? You give up a little bit of your free speech to maybe now have a, well, not maybe, to have an opportunity I'm never going to get anywhere else. We had one of the big company reach out. Um, pretty close in size to the ringer, um, but much more edgy. Like they just do a lot of other things that I just didn't want to necessarily be associated with. And so that was a sacrifice. Like, Hey, we're not gonna be able to talk about things every once in a while. Um, you know, and that's, that's the sacrifice we make. Now, what has never happened though is, Hey, make sure you talk about this and put this spin on it. If that were the case, I'm out. Yeah. I love working for Simmons. He's been great. He'll call text. He listens to the show. He's a good I'm not just saying that. He's actually been very, very good to me and Jesse. But if it were ever like, hey, you have to talk about this and it has to be in this light, regardless of what I think personally, I wouldn't do that for any company. And, and now uh, that's a luxury, right? Ten years ago when I was broke as a joke, I would. I would. I don't care what people say about their morals and all this other bull crap. I'm not going out doing like immorals. Yeah, but like if I got to feed my family and someone says, hey, you have to talk about this guy as the best player of all time and pump it up because I, it's never happened. But back then if someone said that to me, I got bills to pay. Like I, I, there's sacrifices I would make. Listen, I've been, you know, we're known to do that. I mean, Andrew did get a check in for thirty seven dollars and fourteen cents from Michael Porter Jr. this week. Hey, now MPJ. So he is. Did you cut uh, that autograph? <laughs> he did is, you guys see oh. that they're they're slabbing um, vaccine cards? Did you guys see that on Twitter this morning? I did. What is uh, wrong with people? It's crazy. You got two minutes, Gio. I know you got to wrap up. So I have time. Bit, you guys have the cut, so I don't want to. I got I got 16 minutes, pal. I love it. Uh, still, I want to ask this. You know, we always hear first inning, second inning, the hobby just getting started, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I want to hear your take on it because you, you, you're you in it from a content standpoint. You're in it from a collector standpoint, and you also have a business. So I think you have this, you know, omniscient view on where the hobby might go. What's your outlook on the future of the hobby from today? So we talked about this back in like January, and this was a point like I wanted to argue with Ravel about because he kind of called us out for it. He said it wasn't directed at us. I think it was, but that's fine. He didn't want to argue. I think Ravel okay. shaved since January. Is, is he is he like a little more emo this year? What's going on with that? I shaved this morning. I clean up. I clean up nice. His hair's on point. Yeah, I mean, like <laughs> people like Ravel seem to. Um, Your hair's on point too, Cage. We see it. Acknowledged. It's fine. It's a baby wave. The part's nice, though. That's all right. Okay. He has a barber come to the house just every single day to just make sure that that line is crisp. I clean the line up. I clean the line up myself. You know, you, you gotta really look like that. Line. I can't tell if that's fake or not. That might be, you might be serious. Oh, it's real. And his son has a magic line. 
He does. Holy crap. How tall is your kid? How old and how tall is your kid? Can I ask that? He's seven. And... Oh, he's my height. Yep, I understand it. Never mind. About, That's all I need to know. About. about. Yeah, he's I'm about totally my height. About. Okay. I told you. Like, I oh, he's sitting know. there watching this kid's like, why is this 35 year old asking about kids? Totally... Is Chris Hansen on this call? What's going on? This thing what? took a turn. He wants to know if you drive a white van with, with no windows, is what he says. That's fair. That's, That's a fair question. Yep. That's a good question, buddy. Yep. I question. drive a 2004 Chevy Avalanche, baby. <laughs> yes. I do. It. We have so, two new cars. I drive the Avalanche every listen, day. I don't so, care. What so was the question? What's you, the question? Here? The question was, Freaking hair talk. was can, we, can we talk about it in a different way? Can I ask you, like, what quarter yeah. are we in or what period of the hockey game? Well, you know, Cam Neely's still playing, so you're paying attention, right? So, so I'm not 50, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> Dude, I'm old. You say you're old at 35. I got you in spades. There goes so, the immigrant, by the way. He's gone. <laughs> he's, yeah, we start talking hockey. Forget it. it was, yeah. if, if we get soccer on, maybe we get him involved. Oh, but he was asking you the infamous hobby question, which is what inning we're in. I'm trying to yep. put a spin on it. Can we make it bowling? You know, what frame? What are frame we are we in? You know, I'd be like, let's, let's do that. I like that, actually. Yeah, so we're in the, we're in the fourth frame. But if we strike out at the end, we get a couple extra balls yeah, here. Yeah, a little extra, see? Yeah, I mean, I just, all the big-time influencers and people who pump money into this hobby right now, you know, I, these guys that think this is a crash right now, most economists would tell you in a healthy market there are severe corrections at times, and then we come out of those. Right now is a crazy severe correction. MJ, Kobe, Bird, uh, you name it, LeBron. LeBron's creeping back up now. Luca. I guess take Luca out of that because Luca's su super modern, but those other hallmark guys are way down. So it's certainly a market correction. But when when people smarter than me are telling me a market correction is a sign of a healthy market, I think that's a good thing. Uh, baseball is crazy high right now. So yeah, I think five years from now, I, I think we still have a very high market. But I also wouldn't be surprised if certain areas are crazy high, which I think they will be. And then things like Luca Prism are four hundred dollars. You know, population I think is going to have a huge to do with that, and I'm okay with that part. I don't think they should be where they're at now. But but some people say, well, I'm not going to get involved in ultra modern for that reason. I think you're stupid. Make your money now, and then invest it into your big time plays. You want to buy a Jordan rookie? That's cool. So flip Zion, Ja, Luca, and KD for the next two years, and buy whatever Jordan you want. You, again, you can have both. But I do think we're kind of in that third inning type area where there's still growth coming. And then just ask sports fans. Hey, you ever see, you collect baseball cards? Most of them will just laugh at you. Right. And and there's other things that happen and I just think it just shows you how tiny this market is. I think Goldberg's muted. Can I take that a different way, man? He is muted, but I mean, I love the answer, but you've been in this now long enough where you did it as a kid. You saw mm -hmm. it, you know, saw it in the lean years, you know, your brick and mortar style, you know, you're getting your your, your product and you name it. So, you know, I've seen this hobby now for, you know, four decades, right? And everybody's, oh, what inning are we in? What are we doing? What's the story? You know, I'm a little concerned about all the comparisons to other markets, stocks, you name it. Oh, it's a correction. It's a downturn. It's a this. You know, there's never been a prolonged period of success for this hobby. True. There really hasn't. So to, yep. to yep. expect it to now be a long-term forever thing that has peaks and values the same way the stock market is, is to expect it to do something it really has never done. Like and I that. agree And I agree with that. Here's the difference, though. I don't care if you've been in this for five years or, or 40 years. We've never seen this become a viable asset class, which is what it is now. So I think your point is totally valid. We've never seen an extended period like that. But I also think we've never seen this be viewed as an investment. So in that. I mean, the difference, I think, is the amount of people who are in it. And I don't know whether those people sure. stay if the same type of prolonged dip occurs. So so I will I'll tell you, calling it an asset and making it a buzzword like that, it makes sense, right? There's a cool articles about it. You can write Seeking Alpha articles about it and sure. say that it's a new asset. The same way Bitcoin is now an asset that never was before. You know, it's mm -hmm. a currency. It's, a, it's, a, it's an alternate way of investing. But you could always view these as a commodity. There was always Babe Ruth cards. There was always Mickey Mantle cards. There were always people, quote unquote, investing in this as an alternate asset. The pool of people investing in it was just small. And it's gotten right. bigger now because of the popularity of it. And you add in the influencers and you name it. But my concern is, and, and we had Nat Turner on, right? And we had, we had we have a guest on and they were telling you. Know, How is for, he, by the way? He's supposed to come on in two weeks. Is he boring or does he have something to say? I like him. I like him. Okay. I did. And, and I'll, give him, I'll give him credit for this. <laughs> I ask questions that no one has ever asked him. 
right? I, I asked some questions about backlogs. I asked some questions about population control. I asked some questions, and he did not duck or pass. He didn't do like the, you know, hey, pass on this one. He didn't do the hundred thousand dollar pyramid. I'm passing on that question. Move to the next one. He answered every single question, which you know, someone like that could it it, it could have been you know a buyer's choice there. He could have said, oh, pass sure. on that one. I'll answer it later or edit that out or whatever it may be. And he did not do that, so I'll, I'll give him a lot of credit for that. Um, okay. you know, was, was he doing cartwheels? You know, did we have the New York, Boston, you know, your cousin from Boston? Is he a Boston Sam guy? Adams, the dynamic I have with you? No. You know, He's a it, Boston guy? No, no. Oh, okay. No, no. Okay. I think he lives That's in New York. Stars. But what I'm saying is, uh, you know, this is fun. This is a back and forth. This is like a, you know, this is, you know, I might as well, we might as well, you and I watch like the Giants Patriots Super Bowl right, and see what happens to you while that happens. I mean, it's, it's fun stuff, right? But you're not getting that as the knife. You're not getting that with Nat, but you are getting some real good insight and collecting info. But okay. what I was saying was that, that he talked about a 10 year period where if you had $5,000, you could buy the LeBron exquisite auto. And that's selling for, you know, seven figures now. Mm -hmm. And and your family would think you were a lunatic. And for a 10-year period, it did not go up or down in value. There was no right. asset class. There was no charts. There was no our friends at Slab Stocks, our friends at Card Ladder, our friends at, you know, uh, Star Stock. There was none of that, right? So, right? so the difference now and why everyone's calling it an asset class that it wasn't before is we have this just bulk of people in this hobby doing all kinds of things. And I guess my concern is if we continue a, a downhill do half of these people who are in it making a business out of it for the last 18 months, people who weren't in it 18 months ago, if they leave, what right. happens? Are we back where we started? Yeah. Does it just become, hey, there are people who have cards and there are people who don't. You know, sure. There are people who, who held on. I have, I have you know, Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig cards that I bought 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. They were alternate assets for me. There were just no articles calling them alternate assets. Yeah, that, I, I see your point. I guess I, I think, of course, like if this thing continued to decline, would we see some people step away? Sure, because they were guys who have come in, like Jesse, for example, is out. Like Jesse's a guy, and there's a lot of Jesse's in the hobby. He doesn't know anything about sports, doesn't care about him, but it's something I can get into, day trade it, make money, cool. He's out. But there's a lot of other guys you know, who, who came in, and no, they're not huge card guys, but hey, I, I remember watching Hank Aaron. So I wanted a card, and I bought it. I just think a lot of those guys stick around because they figure, well, it's a dip, but I got into kind of, you know, for the nostalgia of it as well. So I do wonder, I mean, I, I, I've, I've very much diversified where I'm at now. I, my, the majority of my holdings are, are PC cards and I just don't here's, try. Here's how I see it. Um, for the last 40 years, Cage, the people that were in the hobby traditionally were collectors, 99, 95% collectors. Yep. When we look at Top Shot, it's mostly flippers, right? And what we've learned is a healthy market needs both. And I think what makes the card hobby different today than it was 20 or even 10 years ago is you have technology, and I'll ask you about this in a second, Geo, that allows for day trading, which you couldn't really do before. You'd always have to buy them off eBay, take a week or two to get the cards. It was just cumbersome and collectors. And now when you bring collectors and day traders or traders in general together, you have for a sustained market. And I think for the next 10, 15 years, that's a really, really, really good thing. And I think that's something that hasn't happened in the card hobby before. Yeah, I mean, I think the as much as the collector pool and the investor pool and the hobby yes, has grown. What's that? I thought, he froze. I thought thought. he froze. I thought he, I thought no, he just froze. Deep in thought. I Internet connection's gone. No, I'm just thinking. I mean, listen, I, I let you, I let you chat, you know, I let you do your thing. But I mean, you know, it's it's one of those things where we don't know the answer, guys. And we that's true. Yeah, it, no question. That's why people ask me in five years, what's a hobby look like? I'm confident in two years right now. Yeah, I feel well, like because of the amount of people, Simmons, Cuban, guys putting tens of millions of dollars in, I'm confident enough in their financial, I don't know, prowess to say, okay, this is at least a two year window minimum. After that, though, I don't know. I mean, what's the economy look like in two years? I have no idea. And at that point, like you said, KJ, if things start getting tough and people you know, are struggling financially, then this goes immediately back to a commodity because you don't need it to survive. And That's if you right. need money to pay a gas bill, you're selling your cards. But I do feel confident in at least two years of um, corrections, peaks. Yeah, I fully expect Kobe stuff to take off. If you look at the upcoming NBA schedule, it's, it's ridiculous. Like Kobe documentary, Hall of Fame induction, playoff start, the whole playoff run, the draft lottery, the draft, the rest of the Kobe, uh, the rest of the Kobe documentary, and then the other Hall of Fame induction for this year's class. Like if all that stuff happened and the basketball market was still in a dip like now, 
I'd say, yeah, okay. Well, maybe maybe these are not markers like they used to be. I just think we're going to see stuff like that happen. It's going to take off. The NFL season is going to start. NFL is going to jump again, even though it's been hot. So I think that's at least a two-year window where we see that kind of growth and just ebbs and flows. You know, in the, And I think what happens all along the way is the floor just keeps getting higher. Dib, Starstock, Top Shot, new grading companies. Gia, what business are you most excited for uh, coming up in these next six, 12 months? I'm super boring. I'll be honest with you. Hardly any of these things do anything for me. I, I, I don't I don't like fractional. Again, I think it's gonna it's done well, no question. Uh, you know, like collectible rally. Um, dibs is fine. I like collectible because their valuations are actually accurate. I I hate rally at times because I don't think they are in dibs. I, you know, he's a nice guy. If, Evan's a very nice guy. I, some of these valuations make me scratch my head, and I think that's horrible for a market. Um, I just don't like fractional. So to me, that's not a thing I'm excited about. Um, th- even the collection, like the, the star stock thing, I just I sell my own stuff. I don't have a use for it. Um, I think it is a very good um, commodity that can be useful in the hobby. I mean, if you can get some sort of an indicator on what kind of condition a raw card is in, fantastic, right? Um, and that kid came on with us. I don't even remember his name now. It's terrible. Oh, Scott. Scott. He, Scott Greenberg. Yeah, 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 he's like 12 years old. He showed up. I was like, where's your dad? But but having said that, I think it's a good thing in the hot. Like, I think it's a cool space. Um, I, I think the fact that you can trade things instantly. Hey, Luca just went off for 39. If Starstock gains enough traction and gets big and you could trade it then, I think that's a cool thing because you don't have to actually physically ship the card. That, that's cool. That's a little bit exciting to me. Um you know, a lot of the other stuff, though, I just don't I don't care about NFTs. because, like, I, But I'm just boring. That's just a me thing. I think the hobby is excited about a lot of these things. Um, grading companies, you know, for the most part, I just tell them, for me, I'm just waiting on PSA. You know, I, I think grading is one of the most traditional spaces in the hobby, and I don't think we, th- we see any sort of a change, changing of the guard from PSA to anybody else anytime soon. So I... I, yeah, I'm like the least interesting person in most of that stuff. Card ladder is interesting to me. I actually started using card ladder yesterday. Uh, me and Jesse both did. I actually kind of like card ladder. The database needs to get way bigger. Um, but I do think it's cool. You can see historic sales. Like you could track individual cards over the past. I think some of it go back like for like two years. I actually think that's a cool tool. Um, I won't use it for my PC because I don't want to know what it's doing. I, I, I'll i be tempted to sell or buy. And I don't need to screw around with it. But for stuff you're tracking, like my Paper hands. You have paper hands if you if you if you watch your yep. yeah. Yeah. So, you you mentioned your ownership. PC a couple of times. What's in the PC? I'm yeah, sure everybody good. wants to hear. I'm sorry. Give us a couple guys, a couple cards. What's what's in the PC? Almost all Brady rookie stuff. Um a ton of Brady's. Uh I've got a bird rookie. Uh, um but this is stuff too I've had for years. Like the bird rookie PSA eight I paid seven ninety two at auction for uh, three years ago. Uh, I think it's down right now to seventy five hundred, but at one point it was fifteen grand. The Bill Russell rookie was the biggest purchase I ever made. I paid, I spent sixteen hundred bucks on that card and was terrified. And now it's I don't know, fifteen grand probably. Um, and the Brady's I just kept. I went through a cycle after Seattle where I sold all my Brady's because it spiked and I was like, this is nuts. And then I started slowly piecing them back. But I sold a championship contender, the seven five. It was either a seven five nine or a seven five ten. I sold it for seventy five hundred bucks, which I thought was unbelievable. And now that's probably I don't know six seven hundred thousand. I mean, some of them are going over a million with a half a grade higher. So, um, other than that, I'm so how do you think- sleep? That's the next question, right? Because I've done the same thing. Some of the cards you just mentioned, I've owned and I've sold, and I'm like, come on, what? Oh, I've sold so many Brady's um, contenders autos because I always hated the look of the card. Um, here's the thing: I always kept almost all of it in the hobby. So I'm like, yeah, if I had held those, I would have this now. I don't know that the net worth is any different because I use it primarily to continue to build and to get into the breaking thing. And so I, I actually think money, the only investment I ever made that I sold off too early when fanatics during the Zion year, fanatics came out with that uh, prism skew. They had their own fanatics exclusive. I had a salesman there and I bought, there's only 350 cases made total. He got me 52 cases at cost at 39 99 a box. I was flipping those things at two hundred dollars a box, and like this is incredible because for a thousand boxes, I held a few cases, and they when they moved up to four or five hundred. But based on the math now, sell if I had sold those now compared to then, it's about seven fifty left on the table. That's the only one because I'm like I didn't really put that back in. I just sold too early. 
But I was like, hey, it's a new skew. Prism's crazy high. We're not going to see it. That one, yeah, that one murdered me. But but again, everything else I, I sold, it's like, yeah, you sold it, did other stuff. I, I generally kept it in the same space. So it's like, you know, I, I, yeah, I don't really look back and worry too much about it now. Wish I had the card. But. <laughs> it's awesome. Well, listen, I mean, that's, I mean, it, it's the way you have to think, right? It, you know, if you're selling something and putting it back in and investing in something else, right? At least it stayed in your collection, it stayed in your hobby, you know, you're able to turn it into something else. So, I mean, hopefully that helps you sleep at night. I have a tough time yeah. sleeping in some of these sales too, but it is what it is. You, yeah, did, you exactly. did okay, Cage. You did okay, Cage. Last yeah. question, Gio, we'll let you go. Nashville, sure. huh? How'd you find yourself there? I hear it's a beautiful city, a lot of culture, a lot of music. My, my buddy plays soccer for the MLS expansion team out there. I believe they're in Nashville. Well, what brought you to Nashville? My I'm wife. Not a soccer guy. Yeah, no, my sister married a musician. Uh, they got married up in Massachusetts, but he was a musician. They moved back down. I had met this girl when she came up to visit. Then when I moved, I, I came down to visit them. She was around, friends of their family. Yeah, we just hit it off, and I was 20, 20 years old. I was like, hey, I, I'd been on my own for a couple years anyways. I thought, well, give that a shot. I was actually in the, in the process of moving to Belize. I don't know why. I was just like, I'm moving to Belize. I had friends who lived there. And like they did like just manual labor and just lived on the beach. And I was like, cool, I'll do that. And then when they moved here, I thought, hey, you know what? I'll go there for a year and try that. Met her and we got married in uh, 2008. So coming up on 13 years. So that was it. Her every family's day, down every here. Every day better than the last, right? Every day better than the last. It's it a great a, thing. It's a joy. Now she's she, <laughs> she has put up with this hobby in my life. I, I wasn't in it the first few years when we got married. But yeah, I still remember when I was like, hey, we need 30,000 bucks to start this business. She was like, what? I mean, we had like, I don't know. I think it was like a huge feat when we hit ten grand in the bank years ago. So when I, when I, there was an opportunity to get into breaking, it was like, hey, we want seventy cases of twenty sixteen Bowman draft. And the guy's like, all right, cool, you got to pay up front. And we we're like, oh crap! Me and my partner here were like, oh crap, we got to figure something. So I did. We borrowed credit card money. He sold his Blake. Uh, what did he sell? Blake Bortles collection spiked at the time. Randomly mm -hmm. enough, I borrowed money from her dad. And we're like, yep, we'll see what happens. And that that's kicked the whole thing off. 2017, Judge Bellinger put everything on the map. And that was the that was the game changer. I'm super excited for like 18 to 25 year olds. You know, it's kind of hard to break through in the space. I'll let you go right after this. It's kind of hard sure. to break through in the world. And I think what we're gonna see, which I'm excited for, is if people do things the right way, if they research, if they learn, if they don't chase, we're gonna see some general generational wealth made. On cars oh, and and absolutely. And how exciting is that, right? Yeah, it's pretty, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting. Like generational wealth now, I think is such a different number than it used to be, right? Like 30 years ago, if you said, Hey, this guy made X amount of dollars, it was like, Oh, you're set. Now I think that X is quite a bit bigger, but yeah, you've got, I mean, go to car, look at the nationals. There's 18 year olds walking around with a quarter million dollars in a, in a suitcase in cards. I, I think it's great. You know, I, I hope kids are responsible enough. I, I think sure. there's too many stupid people with money. Um, I, I just, to me, and I've always been on the conservative side of things. I, I have faith in the card market. That doesn't mean I'm investing more than X percentage in cards at any point in my life. And when it becomes that number and it's too high, I would, okay, let's go through the let's go through the sheet. What's hot? Let's sell stuff off. You know, the real estate thing for me is not like this 10x thing like the card world is. But I, I would rather have money tied up there than other things. So I, I, I hope these kids don't blow it. Things are good. You know, don't screw it up. If, because otherwise, at 18, if you've got a ton of money like that, you can set yourself up and really do well. Well, here's how I see it. I mean, you have one of two options. Either you do well because you're responsible and you didn't do the right way. Or you do well, but you have the experience and lessons. And I imagine, you know, you're in real estate now. How much of the of the skills that you learn from cards are transferable to understanding how to do real estate? I think there's a tremendous amount of benefit of getting into investing at 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and just learning the fundamentals, going through the, the practice. Sure. Yeah, and then just learning like dips and, and how to, you know, be patient with things too. I mean, and just not spend. I mean, that like even with us, when we, properties now, people say it's like the hottest real estate market in the world right now. Pretty much the U.S. in general. Nashville's crazy hot. It's getting way off topic. But um, but at the same time, I just, I'm not going to pay more than I value something at. We just won't do it. I would rather lose a deal than overpay and extend myself, you know? So, yeah, I think this, uh, kids can learn a lot from it. No question. Young people, I hope I hope they do. I mean, I think it's a, it's a cool space to learn, you know, real life economics and financial stuff. 
Well, I got to leave you with a favor. Yeah. Tell Bill, yep. no matter how many times he calls me and no matter how much money he offers me, I'm not leaving Andrew. He asked about that. He did. Okay, he was so like, it's listen, not he's happening. like, I'm he loyal. said, listen, get a number from Cage. That's what he told me. <laughs> he said, get a number from Cage and tell the immigrant we're thinking about it. So <laughs> his words, I don't, that's, that's, that's right from Richard Simmons. So <laughs> there you go. Richard. I like this. This was actually pretty fun. I got to get <laughs> Jesse next time. Me, we don't have to be a show, but Jesse's coming on next time. There you go. Yeah, hell yeah. That's, that's, what, that's what I wanted. That's what I proposed. I know. To. He's a busy man. I'm sorry. He's, he's, Jesse's turning down promotions over there at Dell. He is a busy week for him. He got thrown a big time job offer. He called me yes uh, Tuesday, as a matter of fact. He's like, "Hey, real somber voice, the big fella." He was like, "Listen, just had this opportunity. They just called, and he's already pretty high up with th with that company." And I, all I thought is, "Here we go. We're done." He's like, "I just want you to know, I turned it down." I was like, "What?" First of all, you're an idiot. No, I, I think it's a good decision, but I was like, he's, he's a busy dude. So he was, he wanted to be on, he, he's trying to get more involved with this stuff. He's just, yeah, his schedule sucks. Yeah. I could, I could see the actual text. It was, it was, dude, are you insane? You're already, they're already paying you more than you're worth. What are you turning this down for? I'm now? paying him more than he's worth. I don't know. I'm just, something's going to go here. So, <laughs> yep. Love it. We'd love to have him on. Yeah, man. Bring hey, anytime. I enjoyed this. So, yeah, whatever. Let, let us know. We'll be happy to come back. Beautiful, man. Good Talk deal. to you soon. Thank you. All right. Nice to meet you guys. Have a good one. Peace, Mike.